Welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the monthly live mineral webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the SMMP, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in on the first Wednesday of every month and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to November. I hope you all had a safe Halloween last night and you're ready to dive into the next exciting episode of Mineral Talks Live. I'm your host, Brian Swoboda, and today is Wednesday, November 1st, making this our 80th episode of Mineral Talks Live. For those of you tuning in for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is a monthly talk show that's filmed live on the first Wednesday of every month. As I said earlier, I'm your host, but I'm certainly not the one making this show happen. My two ghoulishly outstanding, and yeah, I had to go there, uh, my ghoulishly outstanding and equal partners, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez and Dr. Eloise Gayou, complete our volunteer staff that makes up the Mineral Talks Live team. Every month, we talk with some of the best curatrix, curators, collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and media people in the mineral world. And I'm proud to say that we are a majority female-owned endeavor in the mineral collecting community. If you happen to have missed any of our past interviews, there is a complete list of all those episodes, along with links to those interviews at the URL located at the bottom of the screen. Now, one of the things that makes this program unique is that it's not only a live show, but it's a show where you get to interact with our guests. All you have to do is participate through the chat or the Q&A features, both of which are located at the bottom of your Zoom window. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching the live show. We encourage you to post your thoughts, comments, or questions about what we're discussing in this chat area while we're talking. Hey, even go ahead and fire off a hello to everyone when you log on and let us know where you're tuning in because we'd love to see what kind of reach we get. Now, I'm based in Honolulu, Hawaii, while Raquel is out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Eloise is streaming to you live from the French countryside. And this is actually the first time in quite a few months that the three of us have been together on the show. In fact, speaking of being together, we just experienced one of the few times each year we're able to get together in person like we were here at the Munich show, which just ended on Sunday. So getting back to location, with just the three of us, we've covered the entire width of the United States and Europe. So if you're signed in, go ahead and fire off a quick chat message letting us know where you're tuning in from, and let's see how much of the world we're covering today. And while our guests and I generally don't see your messages during our conversation, throughout the show, both Raquel and Eloise will be monitoring the chat area and will be very active there. Occasionally, they may even interject a question or comment to us during the interview, so don't be shy if you have a question. And if your question is a bit more general, go ahead and use the Q&A feature, and we'll get to those questions at the end of the show. Finally, towards the end of the program, you'll see a window pop up on your screen. This is our quick fire five question segment to see how well all of us know our guests. Now, this is just a fun way for us to get our know our, to, uh, for us to get to know our guests a little bit better. So go ahead and play along. You may find uh, a nice way of including yourself in a conversation the next time you see our guests at the show. And now on to the best part of the show. Coming to you live from California, we have a man who, while looks big and intimidating, is really one of the nicest and gentlest people I know. A man whose belly laugh will get you smiling, whose friendship you'll end up cherishing, and whose knowledge of minerals will keep you coming back for more. Mr. Rick Kennedy. Rick, how you doing, buddy? Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Kennedy. Love your shirt, Jackson's Crossroads. You're rocking it. Uh, wrong color, I'd say, for an amethyst mine, but love it anyway. <laughs> well, the, it, it's a high viz, so we can actually wear it on the mine. Uh, see how clever you are? <laughs> actually, Rachel gets all credit for that. I don't have that level of clever cleverality. How about that? Ooh, making up new vocabulary words. Well, hey, at least you're partnered with the smartest people. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Rick, I, I always start interviews this way because I think it's a neat way to give our viewers a perspective on how lifestyle started with our guests. So tell us about your early days in Ohio when you were first introduced to minerals. What was like the first thing that really kind of brought you into this hobby? So when I was about eight years old, 
I got bussed into uh, my second grade Catholic school. And as it just so happened after school was over, it took about an hour or so for the buses to get to us. And there was construction happening next to the school. And in I was in Englewood, Ohio, which is a suburb of Dayton. And pretty much anywhere you dig down in Ohio, you hit mineralization. So at, you know, as kids, uh, we were collecting calcite, pyrite, and brachiopod and horn coral fossils, though we had no idea what any of that was. Wow. So you you found things in the ground, you guys were bored, you just kind of started collecting it just because they they looked cool. Exactly. And then as it turned out, a good friend of our family was a geologist and a professor at the University of Dayton. So before we moved off to California, uh, when I was nine, he actually gave me my first rock collection. No way. What was what was in the rock collection? A lot of relatively basic things. But, you know, again, pyrite crystals, galena crystals. I am slightly ashamed to say that uh, over a, a long period of, of time, I, I ate the halite crystal. <laughs> <laughs> so you were nine years old and you moved to california was that santa cruz that you moved to or no that's where you went to school uh, no, Where'd you san move? jose my dad was amongst the first of the people that made the pilgrimage out to silicon valley he was oh, wow. a semiconductor engineer who worked for a, a number of the companies in the bay area over his career right on okay so nine years old did you keep up that interest, that passion with mineral collecting? What happened once you moved to California? I was always interested um, in, in uh, some of the other stuff I talk about. I, I talk about what I call the collector mentality. And okay. there are just some people that are driven to collect no matter what it is. And, and I'm certainly right. very guilty of having that. Okay. So, so in that interim, I collected yeah. rocks, coins, stamps, and I even almost got arrested as a 13-year-old digging bottle caps out of the road. Uh, ooh, you rebel, you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you def you learned early on that you definitely have the collector's genes. Absolutely. All right. So then what led you to studying earth science as your major at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz? Something somehow you decided that you were going to follow up with rocks and minerals. It, it was interesting. It like a lot of things in my life. I can't say that I actually planned it. Um, you know, I'm an Irish male, and when we're 18 years old, we are at a loss. Um, I basically went where life took me. I applied to UC Davis because they had a bowling alley, and, I, and they had a lot of bicycles, and I thought that was really cool. Um, but then I didn't use them, go, and I didn't put, do a major, and I didn't get accepted, but I got accepted into the UC system, and Santa Cruz was always looked like a neat place. So I went to UC Santa Cruz as a freshman math major. As a math major? Yeah, I was, I was again, I, that perfect doesn't fit in high school. I was a math geek and a jock, but I wasn't a normal jock. I didn't do football or basketball or popular things. I did long and triple jump and track. And I rode my bicycle quite a bit. My my senior year in high school, they let me go out after um, for six period, and I did twenty to thirty miles a day. And no after I graduated, I rode my bike to Yosemite, which again makes you fall in love with rocks. Sure, sure. So, so at the end of my freshman year, when I realized that I didn't want to be a math major, I took an introduction to California geology class. Oh, cool. And that did it. Uh, as I started to, to learn more about California geology, I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with geology. And the next uh, 
quarter, I changed my major to um, geology and never looked back. Right on. Okay, so now you are focused on geology. When did you start Earth's Treasures? Because I know you started that when you were still in school, but I'm not sure when in school. So around my junior year in college, which was 1984, I started getting interested in, you know, minerals that were potentially worth money. Uh, a girlfriend's mother gave me her collection, and that was my first Benitoite. And uh, I immediately I fell in love with Benitoite. And I started to learn how to etch specimens and, and clean them, and that, you know, some of them could be cut as gemstones. And I also, um, I worked uh or visited quite a bit with the local rock shop and uh see that's a a beautiful specimen from uh uh my old friend steve perry's collection that i helped prep along with john volter um right and for those and, not yeah, aware yeah, felt, bonita white is the state uh gemstone for california that is correct and it has, as I'm sure you guys know, it has one of the great stories of all mineral finds. You know, some guy goes up looking for cinnabar, finds these weird-looking crystals. The first idiot said they were volcanic glass. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a Benito White crystal, why you'd think it was glass. Other people <laughs> saw the color and said it was sapphire, but it was too soft. And then, you know, finally, um, a gentleman named George Eckhart got a sample to George Lauderbeck at um, UC uh, uh, Berkeley, and the rest is history. And, uh, yeah, that's another one I prepped. I love that critter. That's a one-inch triple terminated Benito White on Matrix. It's kind of one of the holy grails for what we look for. This is absolutely superb. Now, Rick, speaking of Benito White, wasn't it – um kind of correct me I, i'm i'm being a little bit vague just because that's how my brain works uh <laughs> but wasn't it a crystal form that was predicted before it was actually found that is correct it is the only member of its crystal class that was that had not been discovered at the time and that was one of the things that, that louderback proved when he did his his original paper is that it was the missing if i remember correct six over m six over m six over m uh point group okay so you got into that and obviously you got into that because of your ex-girlfriend's mother's donation to you of her collection. But yes. then in the fullness of time, you actually worked up at the mine, correct? I, I never actually worked, you know, fully at the mine. Back in 2005, after uh, Brian Lee's uh, from Collector's Edge sold it to Dave Schreiner, Dave ran feed digs, and I, um, I I led probably ten to fifteen okay. sets of feed digs up there. Right on, right on. Now, Rick, I'm going to bring up this image because we just came back from the Munich show that was all about um, uh, mineral art uh, combined with mineral specimens. Tell us about this piece of mineral art. Well, this is was a, an absolutely treasured gift. Uh, many of you out there know my assistant, Zoe Marchetti, uh, who is an accomplished field collector up in the Northwest herself. As a matter of fact, she is out digging with her father and uncle in the Owens Valley right now. Uh, she is a pencil sketch artist as well. And she saw a picture of this famous specimen known as the sushi plate, which I believe is now in Sandra Perry's collection. Mm. and. She drew it perfectly like that and gave it to me for Christmas a few years back. That's super. That's super. So, Rick, you have this uh, Benito White and from, from the collection that was donated to you. It, was that the start of Earth's Treasures? Pretty much, yeah. Um, I, I was frequenting my local rock shop quite a bit, a place called Gems Galore that I later worked for for a couple of years. And one of the gentlemen who was a, a partner with that owner uh, told me that he had he had retired his business, which was called Creative Gem Plating, 
and but he still had his Tucson hotel reserved and couldn't break the reservation. So he's like, wow. if you want to go out there, you got a free hotel room. So February of 1985 was my first foray to Tucson. And I brought a few of the specimens I'd gotten from the collection and, and etched on. And I actually met both Mike and Buzz Gray that very first Tucson and, you know, kind of started a friendship. Right on. Yeah. Okay. So I love this. What was your impression of your first Tucson show? Wow. Um, My first Tucson show was was as we were getting to a very interesting period of time there. It was the last year or two of the old Desert Inn, which I'm sure you remember. And Mm -hmm. you go into rooms, the lights flicker, but you're you're standing around legends. Every room has somebody that we could write a book about now. Absolutely. It was very exciting. I saw that they had had, uh, I remember in the displays, there was a, a display from the Himalaya mine. They had just hit a major pocket system, and I saw a case full of the most incredible uh, tourmalines you could ever hope to see outside of maybe that little blue cap pocket. Um, right. That little one that we've heard about. Yeah, that, that little thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, your first impression, it's big. Big, 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 big. Um, secondly, you know, and, and you learn this as you go back year after year, you can never have too little or too much money if you're trying to buy things. <laughs> I, I I remember in like 1990 going and thinking, I have $3,000 now. I can buy anything I want. You can buy the world. <laughs> yeah. That lasted for 10 minutes before I'm like, oh, crap, I'm I'm broke again. Wow, a whole 10 minutes. Usually it's less than that. So you have restraint, my friend. <laughs> this just depends on which room you go into. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. So that was 1985. Uh, fast forward, got like 20 years. And 2005, Earth's Treasures becomes a full-time thing. Talk to me about that time and the transition and what happened in those 20 years. The journey was rough. Uh, Gotta gotta say that right off. Um, So I went to work for a rock shop and I did that for a couple of years. And uh, Bob Lewis, the owner, gave me, you know, one of my first, you know, steps into the business and to see how the business is run. And he also recognized that at some point I was going to be doing my own thing. So he was quite ready when it was my time to go in and start figuring it all out. Of course, in 1989, you didn't have the Internet. You didn't have a lot of the access that we now have to other people and to customers. And my first foray into sole proprietorship lasted about nine months before I was scraping for money anywhere I could find it. And then my um, one of my mineral collecting buddies who had started a print shop said, hey, you know, I know you don't know anything about printing, but I know you're smart. Come on in and, you know, I'll basically teach you the ropes and how to run the business. And... Uh, you know, from there, I worked for 16 years in the printing industry, and I found out yeah. that my collecting partner, who I thought was this, you know, pretty amazing, awesome guy, was unfortunately kind of a liar and a cheat. Um, wow, such a common theme in this in this hobby. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and this was just in the printing business. And, you know, he ended up um, going, uh, well... So he combined with another business, the owner of the other business was top notch and, but he got cancer and he was out for about a year while he was recovering. And then during that time, uh, my quote unquote friend embezzled between one and $200,000 from the company. Oh my God. It was rough, but 
you know, they, they say all knowledge is worth having. Yep. So what I learned is what not to do in a business. I learned who not to, to mess with, mostly yep. the State Board of Equalization. Um, <laughs> you know, they never they, they were bad about paying their sales tax and the, the, the government just doesn't care. They don't they don't want to hear a story. All they want to know is when are we getting our check? So I've right. been very good about making sure I pay my sales tax because mm -hmm. you you always try to be really nice to the people that can shut you down. Of course. Um, I also watched how he treated people and, you know, made up my mind. I did never want to treat people that way. And, you know, the, the sad thing is after all of this was said and done, you know, he and I had maintained a friendship, even though it was very strained. You know, we rode out the Loma Prieta earthquake together in that shop, and we had a lot of great shared experiences, but but in the end, I had to say goodbye, and he ended up passing away from cancer, and the real tragedy is, also one might call it karma, um, nobody believed him until very near the end, because he was such a liar. Right, sure. Yeah, but so. all that time, I took advantage. Um, from the moment when I was a senior at UC Santa Cruz and Gail Dunning and Fen Cooper came and talked to us about Calcar Quarry, they told me about a group called the Bay Area Mineralogists. And since I was mm -hmm. moving back to San Jose after um, you know college was over with, it was very easy and convenient for me to join, and I've been a member since like 1986. And this is a group that really knows their minerals. Ba basically, if anybody who goes to a Friends of Mineralogy symposium, it's those kind of people that are members of Bay Area Mineralogists. And not only are they a bunch of really smart people, they dig and they go to interesting places and... It was just a fantastic way of very slowly gathering my, my my digging skills, my identification skills, and you know maybe occasionally may even people skills. Awesome. So you got your uh, kind of your hard knocks in the industry, but not in the mineral industry. In the printing industry, learned a lot of important lessons about business and treating people and who to respect and who to follow. And then you brought that all to the mineral world, and then you started learning uh, more about field collecting and um, uh, participating with other people in the group. That is super. I love that. So Yeah, I've been kind of a master of the long game most of my life. I, I am very patient with human beings, and uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't making a lot of money at the print shop, but it was making enough that I could still go out on the weekends and dig. And I got to experience so many amazing localities, especially in San Benito County, uh, but also, yeah. you know, places like the Champion Mine in Mono County, the Reward Mine, Garnet Hill in Nevada, a few places in Arizona. Um, I've, I've, I've been very, very privileged getting to go to some neat places to dig. That is super. Now, when did you, was it 2005 you started exhibiting as, um, as Earth's Treasures? Uh, I, I started doing shows earlier than that. Um, okay. There's a, 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 a club in uh, the East Bay that put on one of the best shows in the Bay Area. And there were a couple of gentlemen, Adrian Diet and Ron Miller, who got to see me and know me a little bit as a young collector and dealer. And they both helped give me my first chance to do a show. And you know, that, that really helped me start to get established. Uh, you know, at the time I was definitely the new kid on the block, but mm -hmm. you know, you get to learn from people like Cyan Ann Frazier, Jean and Sharon Great Cisneros people. and Chris and Agatha Gallus. Um, yeah. those were amazing, wonderful people to have as the, the established dealers in the Bay Area, because they're all good people. They are all very, very smart, and they know their rocks, and they were nice to a young kid who wasn't necessarily going to spend a lot of money with them right away. 
Right. They were generous with their time and knowledge. Absolutely. And that is a lesson that I am hoping that I uh, that I have taken to heart. Well, I mean, I see the same reflected in you and the way that you treat customers who come to visit you or just people who would stop off your room. We've had you on uh, What's Hot in Tucson up at the Westward Look quite a few times. And as we're waiting for a chance to film you, I've seen you interact with people and your generosity with your time and knowledge is is superb. And so it's certainly you paying it forward. Well, it's it's wonderful to have this passion. And, you know, like most of us that have passion, we want to share it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so speaking of passion, when we filmed you up at the Westward Look, we filmed you because of um, the things that you were bringing out of this fantastic place called Hallelujah Junction. Um, how did you get in? How did you first get involved in that? And where is that going today? Well, I first got involved with Hallelujah Junction. Well, I, I first went there back in the late 80s. Uh, I had heard about it when I was in college. And like most people, I scrambled around on the California side. And then one trip, uh, I love that rock. Uh, I'll tell that story <laughs> in a little bit. That was, okay, I, I named that pocket perseverance for a very good reason. And that's uh, Jack George in the background, who is the father of Joe George, who is one of the greatest mineral extractors and collectors and people that I've gotten to know. So I went up there and I dug around in the dirt like everybody else. And then um, I guess one time I was up there and I'm just wandering around again on the California side, but I can see people walking around up at the top. And I'm like, gosh, you know, they're all the way at the top. I hadn't been to the top yet. And then I heard a phrase that I had never heard before, but immediately sensed the urgency in it. That phrase was fire in the hole. <laughs> so I ducked behind a big rock, boom, boom <laughs> happened. And a, a pretty good sized rock came within about 10 or 20 feet of me. Uh, they were known at that point from sometimes using a little bit too much boom, boom. Um, but at that point I'm like, I got to meet who's up there now. So I scrambled up the mountain and that's when I met Foster Hallman for the first time. And, uh, Foster was really nice and he had some guests up there and he basically told me that as long as I didn't go into his pit, you know, I could go dig anywhere I wanted. And I thought that was really sweet of him. And at that point, uh, he also told me about the road that was there that they had just recently cut that we have since named the Greasy Hill uh, very, very aptly. Um, yeah. So I walked down it. And even the very first time I walked down the Greasy Hill, it was so steep, I slipped and fell on it. Oh, my it's, God. It's a very steep. It, it's it's a heck of an uphill. Um now, so I think know, I John Cornish and, had a story about trying to take his truck up this hill and like a dollar part of his truck failed on him and he ended up rolling the truck. Same, yep. same, same hill. Oh yeah. That's greasy. Yeah. Um, okay. um okay. yeah, no, it's, uh, in the Nevada lithography, uh, Joe George and I wrote an article about hallelujah and the opening picture on that thing is our cars stuck on the greasy hill. Uh, I had gone up wow. with uh, Paul Geffner, Adam Levin, and Dan Evanich, and Jan Johnson had invited us to his claim. And while we were up there, unholy hell unleashed itself on us. This was one of the most intense thunderstorms I've ever been in. And I've been in quite a few. Um, the wind was blowing so hard. I was in Dan's car on the lee side. I could open the window, put a rock up it, and the rock would get clean because it was raining and blowing so hard. <laughs> oh, my God. So 
we decided after after it stopped and we, we gave it some time to dry, we drove all the way to where the greasy hill is. And then we started to walk down it a little bit and it was slick as can be. Um, but Jan Johnson, who's one of the best four-wheel drive drivers I've ever met, was like, I'm going to give it a try. He says, I'm going to go half on and half off the road. And the 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 nasty part of Greasy is kind of like a three-bump water slide. So okay. he was going to stay off the road on the right and you know, part on, part off, get to the bottom of the first hump then go to the other side, then go half on and half off to that side where it was safer, then maneuver his way down. Well, so he did the first part. It looked scary, but he did it. Then as he's going across the second part, he just kept sliding, went oh, into geez. the ravine. <laughs> and the, the, the ravine's not bad. He says he's driven it before. Drove the ravine to the next bump, came back up, tried to get on the road, slid across the road again, and he's like, done. Oh my so God. he called it Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he had a, a, a young collector who had hiked up uh, the um, up from California. He had put him in the... Um, in the car to you know keep him safe from the the storm and everything so he was giving him a ride down and it you know at some point was we were walking down to see if he was okay the kid was like okay i'm gonna take off now and so i asked him i was like you know you're slipping and sliding and doing all this stuff and this poor kid's got no control over any of it you know was he okay and yawn who has an incredible way with words looks at me and says well you know, when I finished Mr. Toad's wild ride, I looked over at my passenger and I thought I saw a tree full of owls. <laughs> Just wide eyed. Very wide eyed. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I, you know, I, I first got up there in the late 80s. I met Jan in, in early 90s and I saw that they'd split their claims up. And then I stayed away from there until the early to mid 2000s, when at that point, Joe George and Paul Geffner had gotten more involved with what was going on on Foster's side. And okay. uh, Bay Area mineralogist did a, a fee dig up there. And uh, my friends, uh, John Magnasco, David Lowe, Dan Evichen and I all came together and decided we'd team collect. And... Uh, so um, we did. We had a great time. And uh, that was the first real instance I had with, you know, using equipment and having a track hoe scraping for us. And I, I found that I liked that. And okay. uh, it was also my first real uh, experience with the type of Paul Geffner that many of you have seen. Uh, Joe and I looked at his own and he's like, yeah, go in after here, do this, do this. And, uh, you know, I'm hammering like crazy. I'm beating on this rock and Paul comes over and he's like, why are you doing that? We have a track hoe here, 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 hold on my guy. Step out of the way. So, you know, let me let, let's take a look, see what you're doing. Get in here and say that. Oh, you're going the wrong way. Your pocket's over here and he's in. Eh, okay. And he moves a couple of things. Uh, okay. Now put your hand in. Big thing about Paul, he wants to make sure people pull their own crystals. So I was, yeah. I, I learned that lesson, pulled two really bizarre scepters out, and I was kind of hooked after that. Right on. So uh, is this image one of the scepters that you pulled out, or what's the story behind this? Okay, so this is, I believe, 2018, and that was probably my best year of digging on the mine. And I was in the zone. I actually, we were between scrapes. Uh, when when Foster was doing all of the scraping, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, he was a little bit older. He had some physical um, ailments. So we tried to make sure we gave him some, uh, some rest time. Because anybody who's operated a track hoe knows you can get bounced around pretty hard, especially when you're trying to go through granite. Um, right. So 
we had scraped, we had looked around, we hadn't really found much, and we realized we weren't getting a scrape for a while. So I started looking more closely at some of the places that we'd been digging. And uh, I saw a, a area, you know, everybody's seen the little cartoon of the little person digging around in the cave and they stop and turn back and the other person right below them gets to the big bug with the crystals. Well, in a exactly. sense, that's kind of what happened here. Uh, <laughs> I, I opened up this pocket more and it did open up. And uh, a lot of these pockets have what I call a gatekeeper crystal. The, the very okay. last mineralization that happens at, at Haleluya is what creates the larger bulbs and the more amethystine material. And ah, it tends gotcha. to fill a pocket. So sometimes you got to get that plug out. Sometimes it's a lovely, beautifully formed crystal. Sometimes it is a mess. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on this and I'm trying to move this thing out. And there's this little, you know, point that's bugging me and it's in my way but it's not pulling and I, all of a sudden I'm like maybe I need to be a little more careful with this <laughs> maybe I need to slow down <laughs> you know it's it it's loose but it's not pulling so that either means it's attached to matrix stuck in something or a scepter and so if you think there's a chance for a scepter you take your time so I spent another half hour to an hour and just made room around it and then finally it came out and what you see there in that picture is pretty much the moment, you know, right after discovery. And uh, Jack was there uh, helping to, to wrap stuff. We, we have this, what we call pocket support. And anytime anybody's in a really good pocket, the team will get together and work with them to make sure everything gets wrapped, uh, often to look for fits. And that turned out to be the best scepter I'd ever found. And I only found it because I persevered at a place where somebody else had decided it wasn't worth continuing. So I named it Perseverance. I love it, man. That is just, that's the beautiful, the best part of any kind of story when you get something like that. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. When so, I'm given, oh, go, go ahead. Now, you own a claim up there now, correct? I, I am I am what one would call a minority partner. So okay. all right. There, there are three majority partners and two minority partners, and I'm one of the minority partners. Super. Now, what about this piece here? This is another photograph that you sent me for the show. Button scepter. Uh, Button yes, scepter. I love that one. That was actually a pocket that we named Lisa's birthday pocket because it was found on the birthday of Paul's wife, Lisa Bennett. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, it, we had some guests over that day and a couple of them were, it's 99% of the guests I absolutely love. Every once in a while, there are a couple that get on our nerves and this time was one of them. And, <laughs> I put these guys in this what looked like a juicy, juicy pocket. And 15 minutes later, they're over looking for another place. I'm like, you know, what happened? And they're like, oh, there's nothing there. I'm uh, like, wow. Came up right? too easily. <laughs> really thought there was going to be something. And then there were another, a nice young couple that were there. And I put the father and the son in these pockets that were close to each other. So I put them back in that other pocket. And, you know, help them extract a, a couple of really lovely amethystine bulbs. So they were really happy. And I'm like, well, since I'm sitting down here watching them, might as well dig this pocket that's still here. And it produced about five really, really special pieces, this being one of them. And that, that little button head is just really sweet. If I remember correctly... Um, that one is now in the collection of Ryan Anderson, who's one of the partners next door. Okay. All right. So these, this site is famous for the, uh, the scepters. Now this looks like similar material, just they don't have the, uh, the amethyst tips. So we get scepters, we get points, we get clusters. And then of course, you know, these, you know, sometimes very interesting bulbs. Um, this was, I think, the day after my birthday in 2019. 
And mm. I was mm. having a miserable day. You can obviously tell that by the smile. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but that I was, that certainly didn't change anything. <laughs> it was it was a company day, which are rare, where where we're just digging for the company, and and sometimes those are the most fun things. Mm-hmm. And I was batting zero. Every single time I found a pocket, nothing happened with it, mm-hmm. and. I finally was just like, ah, well, maybe maybe somebody else here can use some help and maybe I can do some good. So I go over, I see Jack George is in a pocket and I ask him if I can, you know, dig with him or dig next to him. And he's like, yeah, sure, come on. And the thing about the pockets on our side is that they are um, very triangular. They, they have really good structure, most of them, whereas next door there's a lot of collapsed pockets, which okay. gets them a lot more of that late stage mineralization. So they have more purple than we do, but we tend to have better formed long scepters than they do because our pockets don't get crushed. Gotcha. So I'm looking at this pocket and I'm seeing that. I'm like, where's that? Uh huh. So I ask him and I start digging over here. And he says, sure. And I, and I, I move a few things and I open up and it was the, the ceiling of the pocket had just separated this much from the top. And the pocket was just enough size that the crystals didn't contact the floor, but they were close enough to it. So when it separated, they didn't um, break. So, plates like that are really uncommon that that quality because all of those crystals are gem clean throughout it was tricky as all get out extracting it i had to basically remove everything from the floor then take a couple of inches off of the floor to be able to pull them out safely but that is probably the best cluster i've ever found and um the owners were kind enough to allow me to keep it for my collection Ah, super. So that is still in your collection. Yes. Oh, fantastic, man. That must be As fun to look at from, the, from Perseverance. Okay. All right. Going back, that one is still in your yeah. collection. I love yeah, the, that. The, the lead ownership has been in, ex- exceptionally generous with all of us with things that we found. They They make it easier for us to acquire them, and I'm ever so thankful for that. Oh, that is great. Now, Rick, let's address the uh, the issue that is your shirt. You are also very involved with Jackson Crossroads, and that is famous for just some of the most outstanding amethysts that we see in the world. I love the fact that this is an American location. Tell us about your involvement with this and how you got involved. Well, basically... All things go back to Paul. <laughs> so Paul Geffner, great, great guy, good friend. Oh, yeah. No. So once I started doing Hallelujah, Paul started to see, you know, where some of my talents lay. And then after that, I had been involved with a mine we'll talk about a little later, probably the California Blue Mine. And it was an mm-hmm. aquamarine and topaz locality in the Yucca Valley in California, a very unusual place for pegmatites. And I brought Paul in with the owner, Dave, and they started to work together to form a partnership and to mine. And it was during that time that Paul saw some of my organizational abilities and basically the way Paul goes through life, it's, it's, you know, integrity is very, very important to him. And if you're involved with one of his digs, you're involved with all of them. So he started, you know, talking to me about Jackson's crossroads. And and if anybody gets a chance to see one of Paul's talks on Jackson's crossroads, it is a thing of beauty. Um, Paul has a very, very non-geologic way of looking at this stuff. Mm-hmm. And basically, he's decided that God sneezed. And that's how Jackson's Crossroads was formed. 
He calls it faith-based geology. <laughs> so in 2015, he invited me to come out. And faith-based I came geology. Out. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, he he's a tremendous speaker, which, you know, hint, hint, Mineral Talks Live. <laughs> 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 he is definitely so, on our list <laughs> oh good good i'll make sure he knows that i'm about to spend an entire month with him so super he brought me out there and i learned a completely different kind of mining very very wet mining everything is wet we're about 40 feet below the um the the water table um mm -hmm. you don't wear regular boots it's all rubber boots and it's so muddy there you bring a change of clothes every morning and you get into your yucky stuff uh before in the morning then you get out of your yucky stuff and get into semi-clean stuff and there are a lot of times you are mining completely by feel um as your pocket is underwater uh oh with God. the water rising <laughs> <laughs> Now, it's, I've it's, got it's, an image up of you uh, after you had done a face plant. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a couple of years back. And uh, next to me is Heidi Mailing, who is uh, one of our partners. She and her husband, Chuck. And we were in a pocket that Paul discovered that he named the swimming pool pocket because you could pretty much go and swim in it. And again, most of it was underwater. And there was a, a plate that I could feel under there. And it was just heck to get at it. And we're trying to, you know, bail water out of it and everything. And finally, I just said, you know what? Just get in there. I held my breath and reached in and uh, got it loose. And then at some point was able to get myself back out of the water and ended up with a, a lovely plate. I don't know who ended up with the plate, but those those po that pocket had a lot of really nice clusters with like blueberry style amethysts on it. Um, it's not the most valuable pocket we've ever found, but boy, was it fun. I love it. And then um, this is a, uh, a nice image of a typical specimen that really kind of shows people why this is such a popular and super spot to dig and to collect. Yeah, I, I love that rock. I also, um, I, I have a little bit of ownership in it in that it was our operator, Travis Harton, who is also our lead extractor there. And uh, he and his, his wife actually, I think, found this pocket, Linda. And we spent about an hour to two hours with uh, a uh, manual tile saw uh working on grid doing and, and making it so we could get around that thing and pull it out okay that main cluster was in pieces and not on the matrix and i was uh fortunate enough to be the person to find all the fits and find where it fit on the matrix and wow. uh so i really liked that one who reassembled this was that you me fantastic a nice yeah, not my normal trimming strength, of the matrix. But, yeah, no, we, we saved everything, and luckily there weren't too many pieces. There was one last one that was befuddling me, so I ended up taking everything and going upside down on it, and once I was upside down, I could see the right pattern, and boom, it clicked right in. I love it. Where is the space now? That's a really good question. <laughs> I think one of our partners at Hallelujah, Lance Ruffle, who's also a minority partner at JXR, I think he ended up buying that one. Wow. Super. Yeah, it's killer. Rick, there's I, so I many other really spots that we it. want to talk about. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you were doing aquamarine at the California Blue Mine. You've done opals. But you also, are Are we going to uh, get a roaming camera and go look at some of your um, some of your pieces on display? In your exhibit or in your exhibit in your collection um i'm not sure uh 
Well, if not, let's continue with the uh, with the stories on the mines. I know um, we put the poll up, so this is the quick fire five. Rick, you can go ahead and close that window. Don't close the browser. But right, um, I did. Okay, good. So why don't we go ahead and continue? I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is from the California Blue. Absolutely. Tell uh, us about your involvement here. Digs there. I missed what you just said, Brian. I'm sorry. I just said, uh, tell us about your involvement here. Sure. So, uh, again, it's it's amazing how these things all come together and what, you know, weird coincidences. So a buddy of mine, uh, Richard Shields, who is a fluorescent person, um, a fluorescent collector and dealer, I should say. I'm sure his teeth fluoresce, too. Um <laughs> <laughs> he was down in the Arroyo Grande area, and he met through another collector, this gentleman, Dave Schmidt. And Dave lived out in Yucca Valley, and the way Dave describes it, Dave's a really high-energy guy. And he was driving his wife nuts, who was uh, studying to be an RN, and she basically was like, you know, get out of the house for a while. So he had a quad and was running through the back hills and everything. He's like, all right, babe, I'm going to go find you some emeralds and diamonds. And he's thinking, you know, you know, bullets and bottle caps, probably. Um, but, you know, Dave had a very inquisitive nature and his grandfather had actually owned a rock shop. So he was, you know, no stranger to these things. And he's driving around out there and he actually found a pegmatite that had probably been prospected but never really dug and he put the time into it and ended up um you know uh doing you know thing to make a proper claim and uh you know named it the california blue mine and uh after dick in introduced us you know he had me come over brought me up to the mine we talked about a lot of things he showed me things he had found he was pretty much digging by hand and with the um, hammer drill tool and mm -hmm. just rat holing his way into pockets. Um, and I worked with him for about a year or two. And um, uh, also another geologist named Mike Hunterlock was also instrumental in helping him out. And at some point uh, I became his sales rep and mining buddy. And that's it's some also after the hallelujah thing, I, I talked with Paul Geffner, got these guys meeting and we did about five or six uh, projects out there. And it was some of the funnest digging I've ever done. Uh, I, I don't know if I gave you pictures of the DT pocket, but there was a, a pocket there that was above the peg that produced like 150 doubly terminated gem clean crystals. Of course. Now, is, is this one of the pieces? Yes. This? Wait, yeah, this that was is from the California the Blue? Sunset zone. Holy crap. Sorry. Sorry for the language. Uh, I knew oh. I, I had this photo, but I just assumed this was Brazilian, and I wasn't going to bring it up because it was like, oh, we're running out of time, and we don't have time to talk about Brazil. Oh, my God. This is stunning. It produced the highest quality aquamarine I've ever seen out of California. This is amazing that this is out of California. Yeah. And this is actually one that I dug and is in my personal collection. Rick, you have this habit of saying, this is one of the most fun places I've ever dug with every location that you're talking about. I think you bring the fun. But the fact that this is in your collection, the perseverance is in your collection, that uh, that quartz cluster is in your collection, man, anyone who's got to be anywhere close to you, they're going to be they're going to be exposed to a real treat if they come and see your collection. I would love to see your collection someday. It, it's one of the neat things about having just moved to Reno is that there are so many people here that like rocks at all different levels. Um, you know, my, my across the way neighbor's daughter was just studying about emeralds and I just happened to be cleaning some emeralds for somebody. So she got to see some in, per, in person. Um, 
you know, everybody that's come here to deliver something or do a job or something, they they see some of the rocks and they're like, oh yeah, we do rocks. And then almost all of them know hallelujah. It's, it's, it's great. And it's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I'll, the other reason that all these places are my favorite is because I haven't spent an awful lot of time in some of the really nasty places. I've been yeah, to Antero. Yeah. I've been to Spruce. Um, you know, on a bad day, those places are not just nasty. They're deadly. They're deadly. Absolutely. hundred percent. And so was the Majuba Hill mine. That was one of the places that I was underground at and, um, got caught in an underground rock fall. Uh, that was exciting. <laughs> Always. Hey, Rick, uh, we've got some people asking, what are the dimensions of this crystal? That one uh, just fits into a thumbnail box. I believe it's almost exactly two and a half centimeters high. Gotcha. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Now, Rick, we are coming to the top of the hour. I would love to talk about the opal, opal mine, if we can do that quickly, because then I want to talk about another venue that you do every year that is actually quite different than most people do on the mineral circuit. So let's switch to opal real quick. It's one of my favorite stones because it's my birth month stone. I know it's one of Eloise's favorites because she just has impeccable taste. Tell us about this <laughs> opal cooperation. <laughs> so I first went to Virgin Valley back in the late 1990s. Uh, I met the then owner of the mine, Keith Hodgson, uh, at Rainbow Ridge, and I did uh, basically collecting in the tailings pile and had a lot of fun, Went did about three or four trips out there over a couple of years, brought some friends, and then life changed, and I just didn't do anything. It, you know, from the Bay Area, it's an eight to nine hour drive. It's a long way away. And mm -hmm. so it just kind of went out of my mind. And then COVID happened. And, you know, you can only spend so much time cleaning C and D level Benitoite specimens at your house. <laughs> and mining is just a brilliant way of social distancing. Yeah. So I ended up going up there with Paul and a couple of the folks from Hallelujah back in uh, June of 2020. And... We did buy one of the virgin loads that they offer there, and we found a lot of opal, but not a lot of precious opal, and it was fun, and I was like, well, that's kind of neat, and then I talked to some other friends, and we went up there, and the next time we went up there, we killed it, and then I went on this run, oh, that thing, this mm. was in the in August of 2021, I believe, and you're you're basically going through dirt and clods and this was a clod and this is exactly as i found it um oh and then God. i think uh, there's a picture coming up that is the, the finished piece that one that is the finest quality opal i've ever found and i think eloise not, is drooling on her keyboard right now yeah i'm drooling and it's just downstairs <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Again, in but, your collection. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, the first one that you showed is is an actual stable piece. And most of the opal from Virgin Valley isn't stable. And this one was, I found that in July of, of 2021. And with some help from John Volter, uh, he helped me uh, prep it and stabilize it and polish it. And uh, yeah, this is getting to be old. But yes, it's in my personal collection. <laughs> oh my god so rick which shows do you do i know you do tucson you're at mineral city in tucson correct yeah i'm in building c at mineral city at denver i do the just minerals and crystals event i've done hard rock before i'm interested to see the changes that are going to be happening and then i right, do a lot uh, of next year hard rocks shows. moving yes that's mm -hmm. why i'm interested I'm not a big right fan on. of downtowns in, in general. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do local shows in the Bay Area. I just got back from uh, San Diego, and I love going to the Friends of Mineralogy Symposium in Washington. Right. So there's one other venue that you do that is 
really super unique uh, for the mineral world. And I think you know what I'm talking about right here. <laughs> you are one of the few that actually do Burning Man. I am. Um, you know, many of you know Jamie Newman and her husband Alan uh, from the uh, American. Yeah, I think Mineral Jamie's online Mineral. right now watching. <laughs> well, there we go. So yes, we we are burners. I have been out there for 19 years, and I have been doing the Black Rock Rock Shop um, for probably the last 10 to 15 years, and I bring stuff that we've dug, and. I just, you know, the thing about Burning Man, a lot of people think it's like a barter economy, but it's really a gift economy. You just bring fun things that you want to give away. So yeah. I last year I brought Hallelujah stuff. I brought some Jackson's Crossroads. I brought some Brazilian amethyst um, and a few pieces of uh, petrified wood from Virgin Valley and then uh, garnets from Garnet Hill in Ely, which is another fun, fun, fun place to dig. <laughs> So now this year, Burning Man made national news because of uh, a little Swimming bit man. of rain. <laughs> <laughs> that was the weirdest storm I think I've ever seen. The, the low pressure center stalled. It was supposed to be go right through us, you know, five to ten points of rain, nothing special. And it stalled, and about a 10-mile-wide swath of clouds just kept going over the playa. And by the end of the day, we ended up with, I think, between 1 and 1.2 inches. So oh just God. an insane amount. And none of us that bring structures out there bring waterproof structures. Right. So it was a mess, but burners are resilient people. And uh, that's my campmate, Steve, there in the foreground. And the next morning we got up, we took uh, heavy, thick milled plastic, uh, duct tape it around our shoes, uh, put on our ranger gear, went off to headquarters and actually served the city for 13 hours, answering questions, letting people know what was going on, telling them to tune into BMIR radio so Good that they you. could hear the most up to date stuff. I, I really felt like it was some of the best rangering I'd ever done. It was great. That's terrific. No, that's so typical of you. Now, it earned a different name this year, didn't it? Well, there are a lot of different names they've been calling it. <laughs> I called it Swimming Man. Swimming Most Man. That's called it Mud Man. <laughs> uh, and this is one of my favorite pictures that you sent me. <laughs> Burners are... Uh, how do I say, you know, they'll make the best out of a situation. And there are some incredibly talented artists out there. And as you can see, you know, that that is some pretty high quality sculpture for Playa Mud. I love it. <laughs> uh, making lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're coming to the end of the show. I want everyone to know that this is what Rick looks like every time you see him at a mineral show. <laughs> Uh, and that's his company, Earth's Treasures. Now, Rick, you started doing something really unique uh, in the mineral world in terms of, of pricing your minerals and turning it into a bit of a game. Tell us about this. So I like people. And they're kind of fun to play with. Uh, but it has to work out in their favor in the end. Otherwise, it's kind of manipulative and bad. So one of the things I love to do is see how closely people are watching and I will mark an item or two as free and just have it in with the regular stock. <laughs> and I was at a show in San Diego this past weekend and I realized there's a very different way that adults versus children react to this. With adults, they figure you've screwed up and are going to, you know, then try and charge them. So the, the, the adults are like, that says free. It's free, right? And I'd be like, yes, it's free. And they're like, oh, 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 oh okay, great. Okay, and off they go. But kids are fantastic. The kid will be like, Looks around. <laughs> Mom. Mom. What? 
Get over here. Free. Free? Well, ask the nice man. <laughs> ask the nice man. <laughs> Good job. You found the free one. Oh, oh right. Okay. Oh, thanks. And then they run away before you say it's not free anymore. <laughs> it, it's hilarious. And I've seen this so many times. Uh, Rick, that's one of the reasons I love you, brother. You are always a child at heart, a huge, big child at heart, but you are that. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. Um, Crystal is actually from one of those big quartz pockets at Cal Blue. Seriously. Oh my god. Yeah. Cal Blue. Yeah, that's about a with foot what long you've showed thing. us from Cal Blue, I am totally impressed by the locale now. It's amazing. I mean, it's a tiny little pegmatite, but it's great. Incredible. Hey Rick, we are a little bit past the hour, so uh typical, but uh we are at the point in the show where we are going to do the quick fire five. Are you ready? Fire away. I've got five questions. All of the viewers have already predicted how you're going to answer. All of your answers are correct. So we're just going to see how well our viewers did. Okay. Question number one. Are you seated? Yes, you are. Yes. I think. Yes. Question number one. Preferred mineral. Benitoite or amethyst? Benitoite. Benitoite. He thought a little bit about right. it, but he was pretty <laughs> confident with his benitoite. Gun to your head, if you could only choose one, Tucson or Burning Man? Ooh, that's a tough oh. one. Yeah, see, these aren't easy. And they're going to get that tougher. That is a very, very tough one. Being that Tucson feeds me, I kind of have to choose that, but it's a hard choice. Okay. Diffi difficultly choosing Tucson. Question number three. Uh, see, these are going to get tougher. <laughs> Worst thing about climate change. You sold your beachfront property too soon or the club show in Santa Ana would be canceled. Mm. I'm thinking a third choice, but I'd probably go with Santa Ana being canceled. Santa Ana being canceled. Okay. Question number four. Number of miles traveled each year for a mineral show. Pi times infinity or to the sun and back twice? Well, anything times infinity is infinity. Um, so the other one would have to be closer to being accurate. Um, yeah, I drive about 40 to 50,000 miles, uh, a year. So I guess the sun and back twice, the sun and back twice. Final question. Best reason to drive four to 500 miles, a collect opals at fade and crack or B collect car garnets that nobody cares about. <laughs> opal. opal, opal. All righty. Okay. Uh, Eloise, we are, uh, Rick has answered all the questions. Do we have the viewer responses ready to go? Yes, but I'm going to let Raquel answer it because uh, it's a bit crowded in my house tonight. And I love those questions, Brian. You did a really good job and I love the answers. <laughs> Rick, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> shout out to uh, Paul Geffner for helping out with the questions. <laughs> I reached out to him and said, hey, let's get some questions that will kind of challenge and put a smile on uh, Rick's face. Why does Seriously. this not surprise so, me? Exactly. <laughs> well, Paul Gaffney is on so the audience, go. so I'm sure he was having a blast seeing his face. It's super, so. <laughs> super. Paul, thanks for helping out. <laughs> okay, question. Question number one, preferred minerals, benitoite or amethyst? With very little hesitation, Rick, Rick went with benitoite. What did our viewers say? Benitoite. Benitoite. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Question number two, choose one, Tucson or Burning Man. It was a little bit of a struggle, but Rick went with Tucson. What did our viewers say? 
the audience didn't go with the struggle. They thought he was really too soon. 72%. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, worst thing about climate change, beachfront property sold too soon, or club show in choice three, but he went with choice two, Santa Ana show being canceled. What did our viewers say? Santa Ana show being canceled. But I want to hear from Rick the third option. Oh, I'm just okay. Good. The third Rick, option what's option three? Some, you know, that that all of a sudden, you know, my my place in Reno becomes beachfront property and is worth five million dollars. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> Ooh, hey, I'm gonna go with option three too. I like that one. <laughs> Uh, Question number four, number of miles traveled for mineral shows each year, pi times infinity or to the sun and back twice. Rick went with sun and back twice. What do our viewers say? Same. <laughs> Same. Oh, hey, we got four yeah. out of four going to the final one. If we get five out of five, that means you get a special treat from Rick. I don't know what that is. Number five, <laughs> best reason to drive four to 500 miles to collect opals at Fade and Crack or to collect garnets that no one cares about. Rick went with the That's opals. That's a our question, say? by the way. It is, isn't it? So typical. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say our audience thought he would go for the garnets. Oh, oh man. Four <laughs> out of five. That is actually pretty good. That is darn good. Um, let's turn it over to Raquel and Eloise for the Q and a, do we have any questions from our viewers that they'd love to have answered by Rick? You know, I'm surprised because I think everyone was listening so much to Rick. We forgot to ask questions. We were just so <laughs> into the stories. So we don't have any open Q and a, but um, I do have one if I may. So mm -hmm. uh, the lady with the glasses in the front there. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I know you are nothing. Most of most of us, we know you more as a dealer, as an own miner. So I wasn't sure of your of your collection. And throughout the interviews, like that one is mine. That one is in my collection. So what are you, your collection? Is everything that you have self collected, or do you also buy things that fit within your collection? I am a very, very organized, disorganized collector. I that what that means is that I have a lot of varied interests and in suites that go with those interests. So yes, self-collected is a big part of of my collection. Um, at this point, I kind of have a quartz collection because I'm partners in two quartz mines and a third that produced a lot of quartz. But um, because of my friendship with Joe George and some of the other folks that are in the Pacific Northwest, I now have a Washington State collection. I have a California and a San Benito County collection. I also collect uh, rare gemstones, and I have about a 75 sweet rough and cut collection. Um, I also, although I can't necessarily call myself a Sumeb collector, I have a lot of Sumeb in my collection. And um, then, of course, I have locality collections from Hallelujah and Jackson's Crossroads and Cal Blue because, you know, that's all stuff that I dug. So, yeah, I have sweets, but I'm I'm always open to a new mineral that I just fall in love with. Mm. Oh, and an opal collection, too. Can't forget that. Wow. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Actually, we have now one question. I think now people is like, oh, shoot, we can ask. <laughs> you know? um, what's the largest <laughs> or heaviest bingo stone you have personally mined? Okay, let's see. Personally mined? I'm going to go with two potentially, and they're not monstrously huge but they're probably 50 to 75 pounds i carried a calcophyllite and chinovixite specimen out of the majuba hill mine uh that was very very heavy uh i also found up at bald mountain montana a smoky quartz crystal that weighed about 60 pounds and i carried that one out okay that's uh that's a heavy one 
So, Eloise, I know you are you're muted. Do you have anything? You know, read pretty well. So, <laughs> um, if one thing if I could add, I I saw in the comments as as I was watching. Uh, somebody had asked about the public dig at Jackson's Crossroads, and I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the public dig is probably not coming back. And th there are two reasons for that. The main reason is that dig was pretty much run by surface material. Uh, at, our, at that mine, the top 20 feet is all weathered material. And so you run into pockets and don't know it. And what it does is it makes a lot of nice crystals for the feed diggers. But we feel in the last five years, people have gotten pretty much of that material. And so I don't like the idea of charging 50 to 100 people, 50 or $100 to go out there and dig if they're not going to find something decent. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, um, there are a couple of our partners that have deeper pockets than some of the other partners and you know the liability issues when you have 50 to 100 people on a mine are um pretty bad and they just decided overall it was a better move for the entire partnership to just dig here anyways um so we're saddened by that because there are a lot of people that had fun in those shindigs, but I also got, you know, a lot of people that I heard from that weren't happy. You know, they spent their money and all they found were little pieces of Druzy quartz. So in this way, at least, you know, we're not making or people are spending money and having a bad time. Right on. Well, now, Rick, I know that you are headed off to Jackson's Crossroads. I think you're jumping on a plane tomorrow. Uh, where can people find you on social media so that they can keep updated on what you find? Ah, well, my, my Facebook is just me. Uh, so I'm pretty findable that way. And then my Instagram is the most boring Instagram name in the history of Instagram. It's just Rick Kennedy, 1425. Cause all the fun names were taken. Um, <laughs> but that's where you can find me. Right on. All right. Uh, do we have any other questions for Mr. Kennedy here? No, I think everyone was really just taken aback by by how a good storyteller of amazing stories Rick is. Absolutely. And I love your And he loves to tell them. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> and sharing. And I know that there are a lot more that we didn't get to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. We will see you in Tucson. In 2024, well, that's for sure, February 2024. And don't hesitate to say to go and to say hi to Rick and Zoe as well. You know, Zoe uh, is going to be there in Tucson. And I know they're both mind diggers. Please feel free to go and see them uh, at the show in their little shop. And uh, they're always amazing to share stories. So thanks again, Rick. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you. We, we have the most explosive um, you know, room in Tucson because we're C4. <laughs> <laughs> that is C4 at Easy Mineral City. <laughs> superb, superb. Rick, thank you so much for coming on the program today. For all of you viewers out there, thank you for tuning in today and keep in touch because we're going to be back in one month's time with our next episode of Mineral Talks Live. Aloha, everybody. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.